Hello and welcome to the Child Health and Wellbeing webinar um, on paediatric asthma for primary care colleagues. This session is aimed at um, community pharmacists and practice nurses. This session will be recorded. Um, a few points of housekeeping, if I may. Um, this session will be recorded, um, so just to make colleagues aware of that. Um, if people could stay on mute and turn your cameras off throughout the session, um, unless you're actively taking part in discussion, um, this helps us with bandwidth. We're expected to be quite a considerably large group today and um, it would be a huge help and I can see that it's already happening and that individuals are putting their name and the practices that they represent in the geographic area in which they um, are working and that would be really helpful just so that we can um, have an understanding of the reach. Um, do feel free to use the chat facility and to raise your hand to enable us to facilitate conversation. We will be sharing this webinar recording um, and obviously um, an overview of the questions. Um, so please be careful um, to just to remind colleagues to be careful around confidentiality when discussing practical application. Um, just a polite request to ask um, participants in the webinar not to attempt to take control of the slides. We, we had a few challenges at our previous webinar. Um, so if you just don't attempt to move them forwards or backwards, um, the presenters will um, move through their slides themselves. Um, but we will share the slides following um, the, the event with um, the hyperlinks in. Um, so colleagues will be able to access those following the event. Um, Colleagues from the Asthma Leadership Group will attempt to respond to questions in the chat throughout the session um, and anything that remains unresolved um, we will continue to respond to following the event and we'll monitor the chat for a period of about 24 hours following the event. We will be having lots of opportunity throughout the session for interactive discussion. Next slide please. You're not sharing the slides. Apologies all. Can you see the slides now, yeah? Yes, we can, thank you. Thank you. Next slide, please, Claire. <clears throat> So my name is Louise Dauncey and I'm here on behalf of the Child Health and Wellbeing Network and the Northeastern North Cumbria ICS Asthma Leadership Group. Um, our community and pharmacy asthma advisors will lead the sessions today with the presentations and discussion. They will each introduce themselves as part of their presentation. The list on the slide that's being shown now um, describes the other members of um, our leadership group. You'll note here that we have a wide range of disciplines, including secondary and tertiary care doctors and respiratory nurse specialists, 0 to 19 school nursing, pharmacists and also allergy nurse specialists. Next slide, please. I've laid here um, a suggested agenda. Um, as mentioned, our colleagues will respond to the chat and within within um, the, throughout the discussion, um, but we will use the time in between the presentations to respond to questions that come from the participants. Um, we have three sessions planned today to cover asthma reviews, personalised asthma action plans, inhaler Haley use, and then primary care follow-ups, searches and statistics. We will try to keep the time today, and if we look to be running over, we will um, we will we won't have the interactive discussion sessions between the slides, but we will have um, a discussion session at the end, following Laura's final presentation. Next slide, please. So as I've mentioned before, my name is Louise Dauncey and I'm a Network Delivery Manager for the Child Health and Wellbeing Network. I just wanted to provide a very short overview of the network and my role within it. Next slide, please. So just wanted very briefly to provide a, um, a summary about the evolution of our network and the mandate and systems asks and our priorities and where we are today. So historically in 2018 and 2019, a series of engagement activities were undertaken across the system. So health, education, social care, um, and this engagement involved um, discussion and various forums with children and young people and parent carers. Um, this we, we've, we've engaged with through these sessions there was a, over a thousand points of contact to help us identify our system priorities. We currently have um, 1600 members in excess of 1600 members as part of our network from across this from across the system. Ultimately, our mandate is to connect, share good practice and drive improvement. Next slide please. So this image here is just a picture of the Child Health and Wellbeing Network's priority wheel. Um, this, was, this has been developed on the back of the engagement in 2019. You'll recognise that nine priorities 
Um, for those of you working within this sector, none of these areas of priority will be new to you, um, obviously in consideration of our geography and obviously the demography and our health inequality and socioeconomic challenges. Um, we undertook a, a period of validation in 2021 to confirm and validate these areas. Um, and it was felt that the areas were still um, prevalent and pressing issues, and but a further area was identified in relation to family support. Next slide, please. So who, who are we and what do we do? So ultimately, our network provides a platform to allow uh, members of the system to be able to engage. Um, broadly speaking, we enable collaboration and connect connections to make a difference for children and young people and their families. Our vision is to work together to enable young people to be given opportunities to flourish and reach their potential. Next slide, please. So apologies to those of you who've seen this slide before or an iteration of this presentation before, but I think it's helpful to be able to set the scene. Um, I just wanted to summarise our geographic footprint um, within our ICS region. So the first map on the left outlines the boundaries of the 42 statutory ICSs. We're right at the top there, mark number two. The second map on the right um, shows the four area integrated care partnerships. And this marks out within it 13 local authority boundary areas that fall within that, um, within, within that geography. The structure of the NHS organisations has changed since the beginning of July um, and the commissioning responsibilities that historically sat with the CCGs have now been taken on by the integrated care boards. You'll note that the integrated care board operates across wide geography and diverse population and also recognising the, so the wide ranging socioeconomic challenges within that. Um, colleagues, I'm sure will be aware of the core 20 plus 5 framework and the recognition that asthma is a clinical area of additional vulnerability for children and young people in the North East and North Cumbria. Within our footprint area, <clears throat> we work with eight acute foundation trusts, two mental health trusts, three ambulance trusts and in the region of about 560 GP practices. Colleagues in the room, virtual room, will be aware um, that the face of primary care has changed with the evolution of primary care networks over the last 24 months. The evolution of PCNs has sought to bring together general practice with other primary care services such as community pharmacy and dentistry to work at scale and provide wider service range at local apps at the place level. In consideration of the wider ICS, we work in partnership with 13 local authorities, as mentioned, 13 local education authorities and public health authorities and a whopping 1400 education settings. Next slide, please. I won't spend too much time on this slide, but ultimately this is just um, to show uh, members um, the, the range and sort of diversity of our work. Um, we have a children and young persons transformation programme lead, which is myself. And we also I have a colleague, um, Laura Cassidy, who leads on the integration centre. And those pro those those programmes um, often go hand in hand and we work collaboratively together um, in relation to bringing together those services. We also have other unusual projects, such as South Tees Arts Project, which is a collaboration of four schools um, supported to access culture and dance. Obviously, that's outside of the scope today, but there is a lot of information about this on our website. Next slide, please. So I'm, I'm sure colleagues will be aware of the Children and Young Person Transformation Programme and obviously the, the NHS Long Term Plan. Uh, the Long Term Plan sets out a vision for the, fu for the future of the NHS. And the Children and Young Persons Transformation Programme is ultimately a credible plan um, to redesign health services for children and young people. The intention is for clinical networks to be rolled out um, to support the improvement of the quality of care and experiences for children and young people with long term conditions such as asthma, epilepsy and diabetes. And ultimately, this is to be achieved through sharing good practice, supporting the integration of services and undertaking bespoke quality improvement projects. The Child Health and Wellbeing Network is currently hosted by NHS England in the capacity and with the same mandate as the clinical network. Next slide, please. So this just summarises the aims and intentions of the Children and Young Persons Transformation Programme. Ultimately, there are three main aims, which is around integrating services, improving the quality of care and experience and including children and young people more readily in the design and development of service improvement programmes. There are 10 key areas of work, which is highlighted there in the green box in the middle and asthma. There, there, there is a, there's an area of work and a priority dedicated solely to asthma um, and the rollout of the National Asthma Care Bundle. So without further ado, that's it from me in relation to the Child Health and Wellbeing Network. 
I would encourage you to look at our website and find out more about the various projects. And if you aren't a member, I would encourage you to become a member. And we provide all sorts of information and opportunities on a weekly basis. We have a distribution called Child Health Tuesday, which comes out every week. Um, and we share all sorts of resources via that mechanism. I'll hand now to Nicola Jackson, who's one of our community asthma advisors, who will talk, talk in the first session about paediatric asthma reviews. Hi, hello everybody. So my name is Nicola Jackson, I'm one of the um, specialist community children's nurse in Cumbria, but I'm also um, a community asthma advisor for the Child Health Web Wellbeing Network for North East and North Cumbria. Um, so next slide, please. So we're just going to look a little bit about uh, uh, asthma annual reviews um, and what a good asthma annual review would involved. So these are just a couple of quotes from BTS sign 2019 British guidelines um, just stating that it should be a review that is, is done annually and is completed by healthcare with appropriate training and it gives the perfect opportunity to, to monitor symptom control and the impact that is having on that child or young person's life and um, to assess future risk of an asthma attack and discuss management plan. And I've also added onto that slide um, the National Capabilities Framework for Children and Young People. So just to discuss the that ASPA bundle of care, which was published in 2021, um, which looked at how we can improve care of children and people with asthma. And a part of, part of that, there was a working group to look at, at how we can improve education. And the National Capabilities Framework came about. So this is just... There's a link on there if anybody's interested, but there is different tiers of training available, ranging from one to five, um, looking at healthcare professionals and non-healthcare professionals. So ranging from education staff to sports club leaders, right up to tertiary paediatricians and specialist nurses. So different tiers, one to five. You don't have to, to pick the tier that it perhaps is, is appropriate to you if you feel you need a bit more education or you would benefit from more than you can do tier above um, and just to mention tiers one to three are free um, and four and five is a cost with that and um, so do click on the link if you feel that that's something you would like to do next slide please so this is just a guide from BTS sign 2019 recommending what their core components of an ASTRA review should include. So current symptom control should be looked at, future risk of asthma attacks, management strategies, supported self-management and growth in children. Next slide, please. And I've just included this because I, I quite liked this um, way of remembering, but Dr. Will Carroll, um, um, on Ask, Ask About Asthma Week this last year, so 2022. Um, his way of remembering is, is using this little please way of remembering. So please stand in for um, plan, lung function, examination, adherence, symptoms and environment. So you don't have to do it in that order, but I just felt that that was a good way of remembering um, and something that you could use if you wanted to. Please. So there are several asthma review performers out there that are available to use and you'll all have your own one that you're probably using at the moment. Um, this one in particular that I'm just going to look at is one that's available on Beat Asthma, the Beat Asthma website. So that's our tertiary centres, Great North Children's Hospital um, website. They are available to download. So we're just going to I use this currently in my own practice and I thought it was quite a good example of what information is required um, in an annual asthma review. So I'm just going to touch on each section of those. The first section would be to look at symptoms. Um, and I know one of the quaff requirements for you in primary care is to record an asthma control test. 
So several different tests out there that you can use. So the children's asthma control test, this asthma control test if they're over 12, the children's asthma control test if they're under 12 years old, and um, which is five to seven questions with a score less than 19 indicating pure control. There's also the Royal College of Physicians three questions. That's simple to use, but it isn't validated in children, so not really recommended. And there's also the Gina four questions. Um, looking at the past four weeks, um, have they had any daytime asthma symptoms more than twice a week? Are they having any nighttime waking in? Are they using their short acting beta agonists more than twice a week? And is there any limitation on any activities they do? One thing to note on this if you are doing it um, during your annual review, have they had a recent admission to hospital? Is that why you're seeing them? Um, because you're your um, asthma control test will be a little bit altered because it is looking at, at how they've been in the last four weeks. And um, so just be mindful that if you are completing it at that point, it will need repeated in another few weeks just to assess their control and see if it has improved after how they had a change in medication. Have you added extra education? So just be mindful of that. So also to think about asthma control tests and the value of asthma control tests. It is a good idea to do that um, rather than going off what the thinks are they well controlled. Do you just think generally they're well controlled? So to have that that score to look back at, because it is several studies that have shown healthcare professionals' view of whether somebody's controlled does differ to the to the, the child parent or the young person. Um, <clears throat> there was a study that did compare this. Um, in the UK, um, and they found that 84% of patients and 74% of doctors thought that their asthma was well controlled. But in fact, when they did do the asthma control test, it only showed that 55% were actually controlled. So it is worthwhile while doing a control test. Also, look at frequency of salbutamol use, how often are they use in their salbutamol in a week, um, how many salbutamol inhalers are they using per year? We generally say more than six salbutamol inhalers a year shows pure control. If they're using their salbutamol more than three times in a week, um, is that a sign that they're perhaps not using their inhaler correctly? Are they taking their medication? So it's worthwhile looking at that. Also recording the number of asthma attacks they've had in the last year, the number of courses of steroids they've had, so two or more courses of steroids per year can indicate that they maybe need a referral to secondary care and um, they shouldn't be needing that amount of steroids and again looking at the number of AD visits because that would indicate if they are attending AD frequently then we need to change something in their treatment. We also need to look at triggers so the National Review of Asthma Deaths report in 2014 did find that 50 percent of them um, if the people in that study who died have not had any triggers recorded. So we do need to look at their triggers. We do need to know if the patient knows what their triggers are and they tell you what the triggers are and do they know how to avoid them and manage them. It may be that they need a, a regular antihistamine or a, or a nasal spray. Um, so definitely need to, to discuss that with a parent and young child. So food allergies as well in particular, have they got any food allergies? Are they atopic? Um, can they avoid these easily? Um, do we need to get dietitian input? Do we need to get them involved? Do they have an adrenaline auto injector? So if they have a nut allergy, um, it is recommended that they do have an adrenaline auto injector because we do know that having asthma increases the risk of fatal anaphylaxis. Do we need a referral to an allergy specialist nurse as well? So several things to look at there. We also need to look at smoking status. Does the child, young person smoke? Does the parent smoke? Do they really know of the impact that this may have on their the child's asthma? Um, BTS, just a quote from them, BTS have, 2019 have quoted that smoking reduces the effect of inhaled steroids and treatment may be need to be adjusted for smokers 
but I think we also need to to make parents aware that the effects of passive smoking and that this can impact on their child's current parental treatment as well as it being a trigger. We also need to look at associated rhinitis and if that is present as we said above are they having any nasal sprays would they benefit from treatment for, for rhinitis and um, asthma control can be affected if that is left untreated and also on there we need to look at rape BMI so is there any obesity we are aware that there is um, more likely to have poor control and increased risk of attacks if that is the case and I think a decrease of 10% in their weight can have a, an advantage just effect. So also looking at risk factors for life-threatening episodes, we need to, to understand that. Have they had any previous life-threatening episodes with read HDU or ITU admissions? Have they required IV infusion treatment? Has it been that serious? Another risk factor is parental mental illness. So looking at that, we're thinking if they do have a mental illness, does that have any impact on their ability to manage their child's asthma? Is that Nicola, child Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I don't mean to be rude. The sound isn't particularly good. It appears to be buzzing. So could I just ask participants from the webinar to make sure that they're on mute? Um, and I don't know if you can just perhaps maybe mute and unmute to see if that might help. Nicola, it's, it's buzzing. Is that any better, Louise? No, it's actually worse, I think. I'll just put my microphone on just a second. Okay, apologies all. Any better, Louise? It's still quite, it's still quite, um, it's, keep talking. So just checking that that's working. Is that's it, much better. That's that much better? better for me. Okay. Um, so yeah, looking at parental mental illness. So we need to look at that because we need to, to know if that is any, having any impact on that child's ability to manage their asthma. Um, are they having to manage it themselves rather than the parent helping them with that? Does extra support need to be in place? Are they perhaps maybe open to early help or is that something that we need to look at? And do they, does that child have regular contact with other professionals? Um, are they attending school? So we also need to look at is there a high was not brought rate or poor compliance? Um, and what can we put in place to improve on this? So we need to discuss this with the parent and child. Is extra education required to so to look at the associated risks? Um, and also we need to look at if there is a high risk of was not brought, is there a safeguarding concern? And also what's not on this, which we have touched on and I just wanted to add, um, risk factors for life-threatening episode are if they have anaphylaxis so children with anaphylaxis are at high risk it increases their risk of fatal anaphylaxis next slide please so medication we need to discuss what medications those children are on and we need do they know what medication they're on do they know how many puffs of inhaler they should be taking in the morning and evening? Are they taking it? Who's giving it? Are they giving it or is the parent giving it? So we also need to look at the number of preventers they're using. We, you can get, a, I'm sure in primary care, you'll be able to get a record of how many preventer inhalers they're being prescribed, how many they're collecting. So does the amount that they're collecting and using, does that mean that they are being adherent and they are taking their medication? Also looking at the number of relievers they've had, so are they are they getting more relievers than they are preventers? Um, and if they are, then it does show that they're not taking their, perhaps not taking their preventer medication. Reliever, amount of relievers they're using, are they using more than three times a week? Are they using their inhaler more than three times a week? 
And again, as I discussed earlier, that probably showing that they're not taking the prevent medication or perhaps they're not taking their inhaler as good as they should be. Um, just another something to touch on and, and just check that. I just want to add on there as well. Um, it, it is worth during this at this point just to discuss education with the parent. Do they know the difference between the preventer and the reliever? Do they know what the prevent, preventer does and how it how it works and how it affects their airways? I think a lot of the time we do give these medications out and we say preventer and reliever, but they don't actually know what effect it has on their airways and what effect it has if they don't take the pre preventer medication every day. Next slide, please, Claire. So also touch on inhaler technique. Carol is going to go in her next slideshow um, more into this. Um, but as I said, we just need to make sure that they are using the correct technique. Um, it may explain their pure ACT score um, if, they're, if they're not doing that. Um, ask them to demonstrate. If, 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 if it's a video call, ask them to demonstrate on the video if it's a telephone call ask them to talk you through it um, if it's a meter dose inhaler are they always using that aero chamber with that are they always remembering to shake that inhaler before every use and also looking if they're suitable for a dry powder inhaler um, those children that are a little bit older would be ready to, to change over to dry powder inhaler and as we all know it is better for the environment however good technique does outweigh environmental reasons. So if they're not able to use that inhaler, it's, it's not the best option. We want them to be able to take the inhaler correctly, use it um, and prevent any asthma attacks. So lastly, asthma management plans. So NRAD, National Review of Asthma Death, that was published in 2014, identified that 77% of patients did not have a personalised asthma management plan. So we do need to be making sure that we write these out at our annual asthma reviews if they haven't already been given one. We need to be checking that that child young person or parent knows how to treat the symptoms and do they know um, how to follow how to follow the, the guidance in them. So the, the green, amber and the red section. Do the school understand this? Does a copy actually get to school? Does, have you spoken through the action plan with the parents? Do they know that, that they need to follow the, that guidance? It's not just getting put away in a drawer and forgotten about. Um, and are they sharing it with the school? Um, be Asthma, their website, do have asthma action plans that can be printed off and you can complete which Carol will talk through as well, but they do also have school asthma action plans so you can provide a personalised one and a, a one that they can hand to school. Um, also, if you don't always have to do paper copies, a lot of young people now do everything on their phone. So if you're able to email it to them, then that's great. If they're able to take a picture of it and store it on their photos, then that's great as well. Next slide, please. Sir. So this is just a, a little quote from um, the Tier 4 Rotherham Respiratory Training that is one of um, that is in the National Capabilities Framework that I discussed earlier. But just to say that no one size fits all for asthma. Treatment and management must be tailored to individuals. Everybody is different. Um, Personalised approaches to supporting patients to self-manage is the most fundamental aspect of care. I think that's my last slide. Great, thank you very much, Nicola. I'm really sorry um, to the participants in the call um, for the sound quality there. Hopefully we've resolved, we've resolved that. Um, interesting presentation. I think you've brought some really, really helpful hints and tips to the group um, in terms of things to think about. And um, I thought the PLEASE acronym was something that might be particularly helpful um, to the group. Um, is there anything from anybody um, that they might like to raise or ask Nicola? Any, anybody, um, if you could just raise your hand.
OK, so there's nothing from anybody at the moment. Obviously, if you think on, please feel free to put it in the chat and obviously we'll try to pick it up. Um, so if we can hand over now then um, to Carol Barwick, who is our lead community asthma advisor, um, she will talk to us about personalised asthma action plans. You okay there, Carol? Have we lost Carol? Okay, uh, in, in this event, do you think it might be helpful if we perhaps pick up with Laura's presentation? And then come back to Carol's if Carol's having a problem. Is Laura there? Yep. Hi, I'm here. Hi, Laura. Yeah, uh, sorry to change there. to change the the order. I mean, obviously, I think we need to. I'm just conscious of time. So, if you're happy yep. to pick up. Yep. No problem. Just wait for my slides to come up. <laughs> you okay there? Are you okay there? Claire, with the slides. There, are Carol's slides. Ah, excellent. excellent. Here we go. OK, hi, everyone. I'm Laura Self. Um, I'm a practice pharmacist um, and I'm based in Newcastle. Um, I'm also a pharmacy asthma advisor with the Child Health and Wellbeing Network. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so what I want to or intend to cover with you today, I'm going to talk a bit about the 48 hour review. Uh, so this obviously is the review that uh, should be done um, post discharge following an, an asthma attack. Um, I'm also going to talk about identifying the uncontrolled patients. Search is made simple and the emphasis is on simple. Um, I'm a complete technophobe and what I would say is if I can do these searches, you all definitely can. Um, I'm going to go through some tips for checking concordance um, and some ideas um, and hopefully some tips about um, engaging the unengaged, you know, those patients that we really struggle to get them to um, come in for, uh, for their annual asthma reviews. Um, I'm also going to have this just one slide at the end, which is on open prescribing for the IAF targets. Um, gosh, I hate acronyms, so um, do shout out if I use any. The IAF being the impact and investment fund that you'll all know about in, um, in GP surgeries. OK, um, next slide, please. Right, so the 48 hour review. Um, now, we've all mentioned lots of times um, throughout this webinar um, so far and the previous webinar about the National Bundle of Care for Children and Young People with Asthma, which came out in September 2021. Um, this dictates that all children and young people discharged from hospital um, should undergo a review within 48 hours of by an appropriately trained clinician um, in primary care. So, we all know that um, asthma has a huge impact on children and young people with asthma um, and also impact on the NHS. Every 10 seconds, someone is having a potentially life threatening asthma attack in the UK. Um, and sadly, here in the northeast, we've got one of the highest rates for asthma related hospital admissions in the UK. And that's why webinars like this, you know, are being put together um, and we're working so hard to try and sort of increase um, the support and management we can give to children and young people with asthma in our region. Next slide, please. So um, this slide down the right hand side, there's a document from the asthma, which um, I've put the hyperlink on there as well. Um, so this document, one page um, sort of flow chart um, about the management of acute asthma care in children. Um, so it's got some really, um, it's a really good document um, about assessing asthma severity. Um, there's a bit about when to admit, um, how to monitor response to therapy, but it's the bit at the box along the bottom that I want to draw your attention to. It's the follow up box. This is what should be discussed and included within a 48 hour review. 
Um, so, and, and the whole point of this 48 hour review is to recognize and manage um, deterioration early. Um, so, and, and when I say 48 hours, um, it's really um, uh, within two working days. So there should be discussion about symptoms. Um, there should be some form of discussion about peak flows if, if that's appropriate and the child's old enough to be using a peak flow. And that's why during the annual asthma review, it's so important to get um, a, a good peak flow when the child is well to be able to compare it to, uh, to be able to compare it against. Um, there should be a discussion about inhaler technique, um, and I would add that this kind of thing would also be done at the point of discharge and would be discussed um, with the hospital team, but it's, there's certainly no harm um, in, in reviewing inhaler technique. Now, in an ideal world, all 48-hour reviews would be done face-to-face, -face, but let's be realistic. With capacity, um, it's, it's, there will be circumstances when they will quite often probably be done over the telephone. Um, therefore, having videos that you're able to um, text to parents um, with inha good inhaler technique, there's the lung and you, um, asthma lung in UK videos. I particularly like the beat asthma ones because they um, they have children demonstrating the devices, which is often a lot more relatable to our patients then. Um, so yes, being able to text out these videos or just refer them, signpost them to them is, is a great um, sort of thing to be able to do. Um, there's also going to be a discussion in the 48 hour review about the personalised asthma action plan um, and avoidance of triggers. And I think just like Nicola just said, the, the awareness of triggers is key. You know, why, why exactly did that child um, exacerbate at that time? You know, were they playing sport in a particularly cold weather? Um, was there a pollen bomb? Do you remember that a couple of years ago? There was a pollen bomb. We had lots of exacerbations, asthma attacks because of that. Um, or have they simply stayed at grandma's who has feather pillows? You know, lots of different reasons. And it's understanding and having awareness of those triggers, which is kind of half the battle. Um, there should be discussion about long term preventer therapy. And again, this would be addressed um, in the hospital um, prior to discharge um, and some form of education or uh, review uh, that the parent knows when to step up treatment. Um, and then finally, some um, education about the recognition of worsening symptoms and how to control and signpost them. Um, so lots of information to include, um, and, and that's just a little summary there. Next slide, please. So there's loads of questions um, on this particular slide, and I make no apologies for this. It's basically because I know what happens in my practice, but um, every practice is going to be different. Um, you're going to have different uh, triaging. And I guess this slide, I want everyone to go back to working in general practice to kind of go back to their practices and think what happens in my practice. So who does the 48 hour reviews in your practice? Um, how are you are made aware when a child or young person has had an asthma related admission? Um, and there will be, and I'm fully aware, there's a time lag, isn't there? That we often have this time lag between getting the discharge papers from the hospital to, to the GP surgery. Um, but when we, and, and often that's not within, sadly, not within two working days, but when we do get them, how are these discharges workflowed? Um, how are they read coded when they are workflowed? Um, who, who is alerted to the fact that this patient's had um, an admission? Um, and, and then at that point, who reviews the patients? Um, is it done within two working days? What are the barriers to this? Now, because, like I mentioned, we don't always get these discharge papers in time, the discharge letters, um, there is a certain parental engagement that needs to sort of drive this. And this is often the case. So what happens in my practice usually is that um, at the point of discharge, the parent and young person um, is um, the parent is told to make an appointment with their GP practice within 48 hours of discharge. Um, the parent will then phone the following day, the next morning, um, and they'll be triaged by our reception team um, and they'll usually be put on, or they would always be put on the on-call rotor, um, on the on-call list, the GP on-call list. So we have a morning and an afternoon GP and the GP will phone them and review them and find out how they are at that point of time and make an assessment 
at that point in time, depending on how the child is doing, you know, how they're able to wean themselves off the salbutamol, how are they symptomatically, and they will make a decision whether the patient perhaps needs to be readmitted, uh, perhaps needs to be seen that day, the following day, within the week, or at least within the next two weeks. Um, I am then usually messaged um, and then I would make contact with the patient as well, look at when their annual review was due, perhaps bring that forward and, and assess the patient. So like I said, the a degree of parental engagement is kind of needed, I think, in the vast majority of cases. Now, we are looking at a small number of patients here because when I've done um, spoken to various colleagues in different practices, they've sort of said, well, Laura, do we need to block out a couple appointments each week for these 48 hour reviews and no I really don't think that's necessary um I think it's enough um because for example um I'll give you an example James Cook Hospital um they did a study where they looked at for in a year how many um children asthma they um children and young people's asthma attacks they had and it averaged out about five a week now if you think these five kids are being discharged to different surgeries so you're looking at there'll be of course obvious peaks oh, Laura's talking now. Oh, oh hello. You must be ahead of schedule can you hear me okay. um so um we've got summer and winter peaks um and then there's always in september there's always a bit of a peak as well um so um there'll always be um uh, more more patients um, exacerbating in September. So th there may well be a few, but, but we're talking about small numbers. Um, I just wanted to mention as well, I've put it in red at the bottom, that there will be scope for community pharmacists to potentially get involved. And we're, we're currently looking into this. But at the moment, this whole slide is all about lots of questions. <laughs> Go back to your practice and, and just find out who triages, who, the, who they would see, and just make sure the reception team know that this is a priority, that these patients do need to be seen. Um, next slide, please. Okay, um, ways to monitor asthma patients. So I think the vast majority of practices in the Northeast North Cumbria region are either System 1 or EMIS. Now, I will apologise, I'm a System 1 practice, um, so the screenshots that I've included in the next couple of slides are from System 1, but I'm reliably informed that um, what I'm talking about is also available on EMIS. And if you've got any questions at the end um, about that, you know, or we can look into redirecting you to where you can find out the information. A lot of people use Arden's. Um, I use Arden's um, for my um, actual asthma reviews. They're fantastic for the templates. Um, there's also loads of Arden searches which are really easy to access and, and useful. So um, these are the there's five that I use a lot and I just wanted to show you how to do it. So again, this is a screenshot from System 1. You go to the reporting tab, which is in the top um, left hand corner and then click on that. Click on cl um, clinical reporting and then go down the tree and find Arden's limited. And this is in alphabetical order. Um, and then you go to the conditions and find respiratory and click on that. And then click on the first box that comes up, um, which is activity last month. Now, I've shown a few people to do this. Um, I run this search personally probably a couple of times a week. It doesn't change too much, but I just like to feel like I'm on top of things. Um, so when you pull up um, activity last month, can you see the first five are all asthma related? So when you run the search and to run the search, um, don't worry if you haven't done this before, you just highlight the search and then you click the little green triangle um, and it will run it. So when I run this search, um, it tells me that there were 15, uh, sorry, 13 exacerbations last month, um, asthma related exacerbations. If you want to find out whether there were children involved with those, you can click on um, and uh, review the patients and then sort by age. So it's dead easy to do. Um, this will also tell you if there's been any hospital related, sorry, any um, asthma related hospital admissions. It'll also tell you if there's been any new diagnoses as well made that month. So this is um, 
Now, what I will mention is this is only as good, the searches are only as good and only as useful as your read coding. OK, so um, whoever's read coding the letters that are coming in um, and also um, just mention to the GPs whenever they do suspect an as asthma exacerbation, if they're treating with steroids, um, antibiotics, or if they're just discussing, you know, with a patient who they think's potentially had an as asthma exacerbation, get them to read code it appropriately and then you can always chase up these patients. So I like to run the search and then I make sure that all those 13 patients that had an exacerbation have had a quick phone call. How are they doing? I might check this subutamol usage, check when their annual asthma reviews to perhaps bring it forward, you know, and it's just a really proactive way of keeping an eye on things. And also if there's been any hospital um, admissions, um, then um, um, which the mum hasn't, mum or dad hasn't phoned in to do the 48 hour review. It, it just enables you to sort of stop them from slipping through the net and you can still make that contact. Um, uh, next slide, please. OK, so the Clinical Digital Resource Collaborative or CDRC. Um, again, uh, I didn't know anything about this until, uh, well, probably the last year, but it's it's fantastic. It's available for both System 1 and EMIS. It was already on my uh, clinical system when I went to review it, uh, when I went to have a look for them, when, when someone first told me about these searches. Um, and I think a lot of practices use them already and they're probably already there, you know, for like quaff and um, flu clinics and things like that. Anyway, how you get to them. So again, this is a screenshot from System 1, but um, it's very similar to EMIS and the reports are the same. So you go to reporting um, in the top left hand corner um, and then you click on clinical reporting and then you find where it says DCS. Um, and then from that um, drop down, you pick um, you click on CDRC quality and then you find respiratory. OK, so there are actually 519 reports currently for asthma related to asthma that you can search. By the way, the hyperlink that I've included there, um, it has a like a resource that um, resource where you click on either EMIS or system one. So if it isn't, if this um, CDRC isn't currently on your clinical system, this it it does a step by step um, sort of um, account of how to load it on, and it's dead easy. Um, so anyway, searches I like to use. I like to use the CDRC searches for looking at um, overusage of SABRs. It's got a really good search where you can um, quantify um, your um, asthma control test scores and then um, you can look at if anyone's less than 30, uh, less than 20 or less than 15. You can sort of prioritise patients you want to be bringing in. Um, there's also um, a good a search relating to using uh, patients that are exacerbating but not using or ordering regular um, preventer inhalers. So I use those kind of things. Um, so that's that one. Um, next slide, please. Um, OK, so the quaff dashboards, um, I think particularly this time of year, everyone sort of oh, quaff. Um, and it is often a tick box exercise. Um, but having said that, I love the Quaff dashboard for keeping an eye on my patients with asthma. Um, I also deal with COPD patients, but asthma for today, um, keeping an eye on my asthma patients and checking um, how we're doing for annual reviews and so forth. So again, you go to reporting, um, instead of um, clinical reporting, um, you click on Quaff indicators. And I'll just make a note that um, in the top left-hand corner of the screenshot, um, can you see where it's highlighted in blue? It says end of year. Make sure you highlight that because that looks at what you need to do in the current Quaff year. Um, you then go across to asthma, review plan, assessment, um, and then click on show missing, right click, and then click on show missing patients. And then again, you can sort them by age. Um, and every month I tend to do this and I sort by age and then I know all of my 19 and under patients that still need to go for a review. And I know what kind of resources I need to then put into making sure we get everyone reviewed within the year. And just to um, qualify, these are all the, to do with Quaff. This is patients who have a, um, a um, asthma read code and have had an inhaler in the last year. OK, um, next slide, please. 
Right. Oh, I just I had to include the house. Um, I don't, everyone's seen that sketch, haven't they, about um, using the inhaler. Anyway, I'll let you read that to the side um, while I just um, talk through this one, this particular slide. So this is about inhaler concordance and engaging the unengaged. So whenever I'm doing an asthma review, um, I always check the issue history um, and Nicola mentioned this and it's really important to do this because quite often we say, you know, tell me about your inhalers and they'll say, oh, yes, you know, little Johnny uses Clenil two puffs twice a day. And then you look at the issue history and these, they've not ordered it since like April 2020 or something. So how do we, I, th I think we need to be able to query this and feel confident to query this, but in a kind of um uh, non-confrontational, non-judgmental way. So I often like to say to people, um, oh, do you have any trouble sort of remembering to get him to take his inhaler? Or, you know, are, does how does he get on with his inhalers? Or what does he think of them? Or, you know, and that just, and then that can kind of invite the parent to sort of, sort of say, oh, do you know what, actually, he doesn't like it, or he doesn't, ever, hardly ever takes it. And it's that, you know, response which can be really helpful um because then you can discuss ways to help them to remember to take the dose for example alarms on phones for older children or for parents with younger children um do you know i had i did an asthma review the other day and um the mum mentioned that she has this lovely routine going on in the evening because they'd struggled to get it to remember to take the evening inhaler um and they did bath time um and then they did a storybook and then above the bookshelf they kept um like his box with his inhalers in it so it was kind of bath book inhaler teeth bed and you know and I just thought what a great idea of getting that to fit within um the you know within this this child's routine I think that's key um another thing reward charts for younger children can work a treat my kids would do anything for a sticker <laughs> um and um so an asthma and lung UK have um signpost patients to that they have um a telephone number that you can call and they have this massive great big wall chart with all these colorful stickers and rewards and things and they'll send that out free of charge so that's a really nice little tip um rationalize inhaler strengths don't you know really question i, I can't i can't tell you the number of times i've seen clenil 50 micrograms two puffs twice a day get that changed to 100 micrograms one puff twice a day that takes half the time half the battle you know to get them to take their inhaler um and it's better for the environment as well that inhaler is going to last twice as long um Think about changing the device if they're still struggling. Um, I think switching patients to dry powder inhalers, once they're at the age of about 12, um, some perhaps a sensible 10, 11 year old, but certainly 12, it can be revolutionary um, in getting them to take their inhaler. They much prefer it. They don't have to use spacer. Carol's obviously going to talk a bit more about spacer choices and inhaler choices in a bit. And gentle prompting as well. Um, looking at your... Um, um, I'm just checking how I'm doing for time. Um, looking gentle prompting. Um, so use text messages. Text messages are great. So at the start of every, like before the school year, about August time, I send, I do like a blanket text message. Uh, back to school soon. Has your child got their spare inhaler and a copy of their asthma action plan ready for their teacher? If not, give us a call and book in. Something as simple as that. And then they can, oh yeah, you know, just triggers. Oh yeah, now I need to get their inhaler sorted. And then they'll phone in, hopefully. Um, also at the start of the pollen season, the pollen count is high. Is your child asthma affected? Please book in um, for a review if you want to discuss this further. I also tend to send out a blanket text at the beginning of the flu season as well, and that can help promote the flu jab as well, um, uptake for children. Um, next slide, please. Another thing I would say is get to know your local pharmacist, your local community pharmacies. Most practices have probably about three or four, sometimes more, um, community pharmacies that the vast majority of their patients will go to. Now, these pharmacists are a fantastic, often untapped source of information. Um, I can't say how brilliant a lot of them are. They're fantastic. Um, most um, have far more contact with your patients. You might, with a well-controlled asthmatic child, you might see them once a year, okay, to do their annual review. But mum will be going in, um, perhaps 
um, you know, four or five times a year to collect various inhalers and things. Um, they can notify you if they feel that the patient is struggling. Um, they also have information on whether inhaler scripts are collected. So Nicola mentioned, we know that we've done the, we've issued the clenil, but we don't know if they've actually picked up the prescription. And there's no way of us finding that out without the community pharmacy, that soft intelligence that they can sort of update us with. Um, they can also prompt um, patients for annual reviews and they can give out asthma action plans. Now, I say to all the pharmacists in my area, um, so I've, they've all got a stash of asthma action plans. And if a patient, um, when they give out the inhalers, if the uh, mum says that the child doesn't have an asthma action plan, I just ask them to give them one out um, because actually... Um, I would rather they had a blank asthma plan, but which had the full red section, what to do in the event of an asthma attack, which we don't actually complete. That's all the information is there for them. I would rather they had that than nothing at all. And actually, the more they're prompted, the more they might actually book in for an asthma review. There's going to be information on Healthier Together, which you can kind of print off and go and discuss with your community pharmacist. But go and tell them, introduce you, introduce yourself, say, I, I'm a practice nurse and I'm going to be... Um, um, you know, doing um, I'm, gonna, I'm doing asthma reviews in the practice. And please, could you, um, you know, let me know um, if you feel that a patient's struggling. Um, we all know that asthma deaths and admissions are directly related to inhaler use. There's some statistics there that, you know, the Why Asthma Still Kills report stated that the overuse of SABRs and the non-adherence to sort of preventer inhalers um, is a massive risk factor. So lots of information there, but just get to know your local community pharmacist. Um, next slide, please. Right, last slide. <laughs> um, um, open prescribing. Um, I use it all the time. I think it's a fantastic website. Um, the hyperlink's there. It's really simple to access. Just go to um, go to the website, um, find your practice. You can do that by the name or the postcode. Um, and then I put the I put that the little bit there about browsing your topic because it, it can be tricky to find the respiratory thing. Well, I found it quite tricky. Um, so just make sure you go to click show all and then respiratory will come up because it's in alphabetical order. Um, there are four main indicators. Um, and basically this is your individual practices prescribing. So this is based on the EPAC, the actual prescribing data. OK, um, and this will go through everything. Um, it will tell you the mean carbon dioxide impact for every salbutamol inhaler prescribed. It will go through the proportion of salbutamol inhalers um, compared with all salbutamol and preventer inhalers. So obviously we want that to be as low as possible, uh, which shows that patients are using their preventers and not having to order lots of salbutamols. And there's also a particular indicator, which is great, and everything's got these lovely little charts and um, graphs rather, so you can print those out and show your colleagues. Um, there's a, the last one that I use is the PMDIs as a proportion of all prescribed indicators. Obviously, as a country, we need to be pushing the greener inhaler agenda, but exactly like Nicola said, this is only where appropriate when we're talking about asthma in children. OK, um, sorry, I've just talked constantly. <laughs> um, that's everything from me. Um, does anyone have any questions? Thanks, Laura. Thanks. That was a, a really fantastic presentation with lots and lots of information. Uh, not to worry, we will share the slides, so the links and the detail will be available to colleagues um, to look at in their leisure. Um, there was a, few, a bit of a conversation going on about the availability of um, the availability of stickers, stickers and reward charts, and obviously that's been responded to. They're available on Asthma and Lung UK. Um, is there anything else from any anyone else? Oh, oh there's a I question here. Well. Oh. Mm -hmm. Excellent, as if by magic. Here's one. I, here's what I prepared earlier. Um, yeah. there's, a, there's a question here um, from Tracy Thompson. Should inhalers should be kept in the fridge? Um, no, there's a particular inhaler. Um, correct me if there's any other pharmacist um, here, but it's Foster, which has to be kept in the fridge um, if, by the pharmacy. And then the minute it's dispensed, you then um, it, it would then be kept out of the fridge. But it's for sort of um, storage. It's stored in the fridge, and then the minute it's dispensed, um, no. And I can't think of any other inhalers that we keep in the fridge. It's just, I'm pretty sure it's just Foster that's kept in the fridge. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Is is there anything else from anybody else?
No hands or no more questions. OK, so I apologise earlier about our slight technical glitch and um, we do hopefully have Carol back uh, to present what would have been part two of this presentation, um, which is about personalised asthma action plans um, and the use of inhalers. Uh, before we move on to Carol, we do just have another question, Laura, here um, about how long do you get for your asthma reviews? Um, I have 15 to 20 minutes for my asthma reviews. Personally, that's how long I have. 20 minutes if it's face to face and 15 minutes if it's a telephone, which is there's a lot to pack in there. So quite often I will say if, you know, I will book another appointment if there's still issues or I feel like I haven't been able to cover everything. OK, thanks. Helpful tip. OK, so Laura will continue to respond in the chat if there's anything else. Over to you, Carol. Thank you. Can I just check that everyone can hear me? Yes. Lovely. Thank you. Um, my name's Carol Barwick. I'm Children's Respiratory Nurse Specialist and also Lead Community Asthma Advisor of the Child Health and Wellbeing Network in the North East and North Cumbria. Um, I'd just like to thank everybody for this opportunity to speak to you today and apologise again for the, the technical hitch. Um, next slide, please. I'd like to start talking about personalised asthma action plans. Um, we've got some very good guidelines for asthma and asthma management, NICE guidance, BTS and SIGN guidance, and all of these guidelines suggest that we use written management plans. There is a consensus also from national audit and studies that personal asthma action plans are still underutilized and undervalued. Um, in fact, to back the, the use of my asthma management plans and the relevance of information being written, a study from 2003 suggests that patients actually only retain between 40 and 80% of the medical information that we share with them verbally, and also that there, when that has been researched into how much of that information is actually correct, we, there is a realisation that actually only half of the information is recalled correctly. Therefore, um, being able to write information is really important for every patient. Next slide, please. The importance of asthma management plans. Well, we know that the successful of treat, uh, treatment of asthma involves regular monitoring of symptoms, understanding how and when and which medications treat asthma, and identifying and avoiding asthma triggers. And this all together is done um, under the review of a trained health professional. Asthma management plans are individual agreements with the patient to promote a clear understanding of asthma and symptoms, medication and when to seek medical help, together with monitoring of symptoms, including peak flow and diaries, which can also be useful for the management of asthma. Within this asthma management plan, there may be the opportunity to also um, revise inhaler technique, which has been discussed several times already. And it's important that information is given and a demonstration of the correct technique to ensure the best deposition. Most importantly, within a management plan is the actions to take when symptoms increase. So we need to be talking about and understanding with our patients what those in symptoms actually look like and how long that this should be monitored before further action is required. We know that there's multiple potential triggers for asthma and these can't always be avoided but exposure can be reduced. And as long as the patient is aware of what their triggers actually are, there can be a lot of work done at home and with the environment to reduce these triggers. And these triggers should be recorded on their written asthma management plan so that all carers are aware of potential risk. Next slide, please. Here's an example of management plans. Now, it may be that you, you use a different management plan in your practice. There's several around. There's some very good management plans. What I've done is I've compared and contrasted two, two very good management plans. On the left-hand side there, we've got an example of the outer form of the management plan from B to Asthma. And on the right-hand side from Asthma and Lung UK, they have some very complementary features in both of those. And throughout the work that we've been doing um, with the leadership group, we do know that there's several different forms being used by several different areas and some, some practices have actually got their own and some secondary care settings have actually got their own plans. And in principle, um, the content 
if, as long as there is similar content and the main messages are getting across to your patient, then really we're quite happy for you to use you know, what you find most useful and usable. However, we have found these to be a very, two very good examples of, of asthma management plans. Next slide, please. In terms of, of asthma management plans, you can see the example here is the traffic light system is a very good way of explaining to your patient what is going well, what's not going so well, and when the patient should know how to respond and react if symptoms are exacerbating. Patients record, report higher levels of adherence with medication who are prescribed by physicians who communicate well and whose interaction is described as including their patients within their talk, uh, within their discussion, sorry. Um, the traffic light system talks about when asthma is well controlled, what that feels like to the patient. Um, amber is for caution, what happens when a child's symptoms exacerbate, what happens if they've got a cough or a cold, or the parent recognises the signs that their child is changing, that you know their day-to-day -day control of asthma has changed and things are getting worse. And the red section is action needed and there's been deterioration or poor response to their SABA and there, there needs to be a, a consideration for seeking medical help. I think also it's really important to discuss what's individual to that patient and these management plans give, have sections on both of them for additional comments or information. We know that all children with asthma um, respond differently to their medication. They have different signs and symptoms. And these can be recorded and added to their management plan so that everyone looking after this child may be able to look at the specific signs that a child is not well or not as well controlled as they usually are. It's important, really important to consider the overuse of SABA and, and what has been traditional or inherited, inherent over the last few years is the immediate use of 10, 10 squirts or 10 puffs or 10 doses of blue inhaler. And we've been able to say that, that families can use up to 10, 10 doses of blue inhaler if they feel that their child's um, asthma is deteriorating. However, there's been several studies to suggest and observations to suggest that a lot of parents immediately use 10 doses of blue inhaler rather than thinking, could I use two squirts or four, four doses prior to going up to that large dose? It's now, there's research and evidence emerging which is included in these plans. And it's to encourage the progression up to six puffs gradually initially, and that 10 puffs should be used in reserve of severe and difficult or an acute exacerbation. And if we really are considering using 10 squirts of blue inhaler without evidence of improvement, it would that would initiate um, an assessment or review with a medical practitioner. Next slide, please. The Asthma and Lung UK Management Plan, if you can see, it works on a very similar basis in terms of my everyday care for asthma, what my treatments are, how to recognise signs that things aren't going well, and who to call. The AMBER section talks about this very on a very similar principle in terms of recognising what what is changing and what actions the parent need to take or the young person themselves if they're old enough to take control of their asthma and also a red section on and when when to seek medical help and what action should be taken prior to that medical help similar ideas similar themes and messages on the asthma and lung uk there isn't an opportunity to write to measure or write peak flows but there is a free a free um box that that can be written into so the parent and family can understand about peak flows and what to look out for. As already mentioned, it's really important that parents, patients, families and anyone coming into contact with a child or young person with asthma um, knows the content of the management plan, but not only that, it ha has a copy of the management plan. And with our work in school, with schools in the regions, we are sending out messages to schools the expectation that a management plan should be sent to school with children and they are, if they are able to copy that plan or get that plan emailed to school then it's a really useful um it's a really really useful part of asthma management within school Carol I think you've just gone on mute there
Can you hear Carol? You're back. Yeah. Bit Sorry, where, where was that from? You were talking about the use of them in schools and the fact that schools that we've been sending out the message about use of the use of these personalised asthma action plans. You're also slightly muffly. I don't know whether or not you can um, whether it's a microphone issue or. Apologies. Is that better? Yes, I think just I think it's just if you speak maybe closer to the mic. Apologies all. No, it's OK. Thank you. Um, next in, next slide, please. So just next, moving on to inhalers, challenges and choices. Next slide, please. We know that there's a standard from the National Bundle of Care emphasising the importance of regular assessment of control and device appropriate to age and ability of use. Next slide, please. We know that there's many challenges in prescribing for children and young people. What's significant is that there is a, there is a significant age range to consider, right from the under fives, right up to young people and adolescents. We know that an inhaler device is only as good as one a child will agree to take. There's many different inhalers have specific ways to use them and the need to check suitability is really, really important. Children and young people like to be included in clinic and personally, from a personal experience, I find that children as young as five and six like to answer questions, they like to be involved, they like to look and learn. And we have, we have working models of, uh, of lungs and airways and they like to find out what's going on. So that's really important to include children. Once a child feels included, then I think you, they, they're engaged and they feel important and can play a part in, in their asthma management. I think it's important to consider level of understanding it and capability that should be assessed and it's important to get the child and young person to express their level of understanding on what's being said to them. We need to discuss things like the onset of symptoms, the speed and the variability and that can direct our choice of inhaler selected. We know that deposition can vary greatly between devices meter dose inhalers may only have minimal deposition and we know that the greatest deposition for medication is within an spacer and MDI. We know that there's challenges to professionals across the age ranges when ch children and young people refuse to take their medication or sometimes won't accept that they actually need to. There's a specific challenge in adolescence and we know this with poor attendance and concordance and some risk-taking behaviours. But as Laura's already mentioned, there are, some, there are some very useful things that we can do with this age group. We can consider things like apps on their phones. Um, Apple watches have the ability to record how much inhalers you take. We, young people are putting reminders on their phones. They're putting alarms on. And I, knew, I do know of a young boy who, when I asked him how, how good, it, I asked him how he'd come, become so good with his inhalers. He said, well, it's okay, because Alexa reminds me. And I said, oh, is Alexa your sister? And he said, no, Alexa. He said, I just put my, he said, I tell her all about the, when I need to take my inhalers. And she says, Robert, you need to take your inhalers. So I'd never thought of that before. So because he told me that, I've used that often with children and young people as, as um, another way of reminding them to take their inhalers. We know that explaining and uh, the rationale to treatment is really important. And, and signposting children to websites and families. Families like to look on websites. Beat Asthma, for example, our regional resource, has some very good sections for children and young people to help them understand their asthma. Next slide, please. So we know that there, there, is, there can be a significant impact of poor inhaler technique. We know that asthma control can be poor. There can be increased morbidity. Um, poor technique and poor deposition leads to increasing symptoms and lack of control. It also wastes medication as medication is not getting into the lungs. And the more, then more puffs and more medication is required to get the desired effect. We know there can be local side effects such as throat and hoarse voice. And we offer guidance on rinsing after taking in inhalers, which is really important. And it can be just as important as the correct technique. Next slide, please. Moving on to diagnosis in the under fives, 
we know that diagnosis in this age group is challenging. It's based upon a detailed history of symptoms and family history. Asthma diagnosis is confirmed over a period of time in response to treatment. And the symptoms of asthma can be confused with those of other respiratory diseases in the more younger, the more younger age group. We do know, with reference to the HSB report, when a child had a numerous planned and unplanned emergency attendances at hospital with respiratory symptoms before suffering a near fatal asthma attack. Prior to the event, this child had had no formal diagnosis of asthma and issues had been identified but not resolved regarding adherence to treatment. So in, in, in conclusion to the report, there is some consideration that it may well be a safer plan to diagnose a child or to, to discuss whether that child is probable or possible asthma. And there's clear messages for, for professionals regarding diagnosis in the under five, in that un, under fives can be diagnosed. But I think the messages have been, um, the messages have been, um, sorry, shared that objective testing is difficult to do until the age of five, which has led to the misconception that asthma cannot be diagnosed until this age. Next slide, please. We have some very good guidelines on the management of asthma and the therapeutic management of asthma. BTS guidelines, stepwise approach, consider the groups of medication and a practical and methodical approach to treatment. Here, types and groups of treatment are recommended at each stage when the child remains symptomatic. The importance of regular review is emphasized and treatment can be increased as deemed necessary, but equally as important reducing the treatment follow, following a period of stability is, is important too. Lung function can be a very useful adjunct in decision making, as can pheno where and when this is available. Next slide, please. So age-related choices in the under fives, in some cases, this can be significantly variable, and this is based upon understanding and the stages of development for children. Not all children develop in this at the same speed and in the same way. And we have found from my personal experience that some of our older children are using a spacer, still like to use the mask. This is obviously to be discouraged because the deposition is improved when the mask is removed and the tidal, the tidal breath technique is used. But this might also be the case with children with disabilities. And I have seen children with disabilities using their mask because they feel comfortable with it. They're used to it. They like using it. Some trusts we found are moving to Aerochamber Plus Views, which is a smaller version of Aerochambers. <coughs> Excuse me. Due to improved deposition and tolerance of the smaller generation of spaces. Next slide, please. In terms of using a space device with mask, it's important that the inhaler is shaken, inserted into the end of the spacer, and that the mask is over the nose and mouth, slightly tipped, and that the spacer <coughs> excuse me, is held over the nose and mouth for 20 seconds per dose, and that 30 seconds space is allowed before the next dose is repeated. Next slide, please. Over five inhaler choices. Consider on an individual basis if a child can use a spacer without the mask. Consider the age, ability and understanding and demonstrate the inhaler technique and guide the use of resources, including beat asthma and asthma lung UK. And try as best we can to include children in inhaler and spacer choices, which can be really important. In terms of sport, children who do sport and out of school activities, thinking about the portability and practicality of using a spacer, particularly within school. <coughs> Excuse me. Using a spacer device without mask, shake the inhaler, insert into the end of the spacer. The child starts doing a breathing technique and insert one puff. The technique is that a child does four to five slow breaths at a normal breathing rate and listen for the click with each breath, which will demonstrate the child's ability to use the spacer correctly. And again, to wait 30 seconds between doses is really important in order for the um, inhaler to warm up. It's a very, it gives a very cold blast and therefore the next one 
um, is ineffective if you don't wait for that time. Next slide, please. Common errors in an inhaler technique is that the device isn't correctly loaded. <coughs> They're not exhaling fully before delivering the dose. Not, it's really important that the inhaler is shaken because the gas separates in 10 seconds. We've talked about the wait for 30 seconds. Um, and there's different flow rates for different inhalers. So it's really important that we understand how each different inhaler works and holding the breath at the, particularly using a dry powder device is very important because it increases deposition into the chest. Next slide, please. So when will we consider a dry powder device? Asthma, the potential for asthma to be well controlled is really important. If not, the dry powder device may be consideration because that the patient or the young person might, might be asking you, can they, can they use a dry, dry powder device or try a dry powder device? If a child or young person is active, it may, not, it may be more suitable for them to carry a dry powder device. And all, but it's very important to know that once a child has been changed to a dry powder device, it's important that the large volume spacer and the inhaler is still available should the child's inhale, should the child asthma exacerbate during activity or within school. We know that dry powder devices and soft mist inhalers have a much lower carbon footprint, which has already been mentioned today, um, much, much lower than pressurized meter dose inhalers. And this is because they don't contain propellants that produce powerful greenhouse gases. And, and it also, choice might be just personal and individual choice. And as I'm sure has been previously mentioned, an inhaler or a device is only one that's as good as a child agrees to use. Next slide, please. So just to finish off with common questions. So the, the one I've put here is, you know, mum say my my young, my child or my baby cries and refuses to take the inhaler and spacer. And, and I think this is a difficult one, isn't it? Because making the making inhalers full fun time is a challenge with smaller children. But we do know things like involving the child in the choices about when and where they have their inhalers and initiating play tactics where possible, with, which will encourage a child to tolerate ma the mask on, on their face gently. Thinking about Laura's already spoken about things like rewards, getting into a pattern, thinking about um, available things that are available on Asthma Lung in UK, sticker charts, reward charts, and, and looking at the studies that suggest that deposition into the lung in a sleeping baby is actually better than that if a child is distressed. So often in clinic, we talk to parents about things like clapping songs, singing songs, nursery rhymes, rewarding them with watching, you know, watching something on the TV of their favourite just for a few minutes, just for that distraction while they take their inhalers. Um, there are, there are lots of other challenges associated with inhalers and spaces, but I thought I would actually talk about this younger age group because that's that's more of a challenge to um, to smaller children and to young children, particularly two to three year olds who, who are quite distinct about their, what they want to have happen to them. And we talk about things like doing their inhalers and then brushing their teeth. And obviously, to be realistic, some parents say, well, I really struggle to get them to brush their teeth as well. So these are just some ideas on how we can get um, children and, and young people to take their inhalers better. And I'm sure we could have a, a detailed discussion on ideas that also that people may also have about this age group. I, th I think that's the end of that and I think uh, of those slides and I think we've um, we've come to a, a, a reasonable conclusion. I think please please add any questions and I I'm sorry I do apologize for my delay in starting my slide set. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Carol. That was a, a really helpful presentation. I think it, it's really valuable to sort of share with the group the value that we that, that can be had from the personalised asthma action planning process, um, and also in the day to day delivery of you know asthma care management across the system. And the references to schools, I thought, was really really helpful. Um, 
I appreciate we've had quite a few technical glitches today in relation to um, the presentation and the shuffling around of the agenda, um, but would like to take the opportunity, and we've just got a few minutes left, um, to allow anybody who has any questions um, that could be answered by the team. I've been watching the chat and there's been nothing that's kind of jumped out at me that we need to pick up on particularly. Um, does anybody in, in the group have anybody any questions that they might like to put forward? Oh, there's some questions there that uh, we've that have been shown previous slide. Um, right, nobody's showing any hands there. Um, obviously, as we've mentioned, please feel. F oh, here we go. There is a question here. Um, Laura Parsons, uh, with peak flow and amber section, how much of a reduction would you put from their baseline peak flows? Um, oh, Sam, did you want to answer this one? I was going to say, correct me if I'm wrong, isn't it about 20, 20 to 30 percent reduction? I'll pass over to Dr. Moss, though. <laughs> yeah, so we would normally say about a third. Yep, so about 30 percent reduction for ease of the maths, yeah. OK. Right, great, fabulous. Anything else from anybody? OK, then. So if I could just take a couple of minutes of your time just to kind of cl close the session and provide you with some further um, ad advice, pointers and resources. Um, I'm really grateful um, for people to, to people for staying on, on an evening and listening um, to this this presentation um, we, we really appreciate that obviously it's out of hours and it's uh, you know an extra but we hope that it's been a helpful opportunity for colleagues as I've mentioned we will continue um, to respond um, to the questions that come in the chat if anyone thinks on following this event we'll be monitoring it for the next day or so um, and once we've um, been able to download the video, we will make it available on our Healthier Together website. And of course, I will share the link uh, with participants today, as well as the various slide decks that we've showed today. Um, and obviously, that will allow people to have a think and if they've got any further questions. Um, I would like to draw colleagues' attention to the um, Healthier Together resources that are available, um, and in particular, the reference to the TRIPT programme of work that we've got with the network that stands for Tackling Respiratory Illness in Poverty Together. Um, and essentially, it's a piece of work that's been done by the network on the back of a, a report by the Institute of Health Equity about fuel poverty. Um, there's been a piece of work done um, to, to pull together um, a, a list or a, a repository of resources and advice and guidance and that's hosted on Healthy Together and the slide there includes the link to that to those resources. Um, we've also got a short recorded presentation which is 12 minutes long uh, which is currently also hosted on the Healthy Together website for primary care colleagues um, to be able to have a, um, a shorter summary if it was perhaps maybe something you could share within your own practice if people just want a taster um, to have a bit of background about the National Asthma Care Bundle etc. Um, I've included on the, the slide as well a link to the e-learning for health tiered training, which um, Nicola referred to at the very beginning, which was the, the you know the, the the competency framework and the five levels of training. And um, the link is there. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to invite colleagues or advise colleagues at least of the um, of the of a conference that we're looking to host um, or the Paediatric Asthma Network are looking to um, host on the 6th of June. It will be head at the, held at the Fed at Gateshead um, and it, there's a link on there to be able to register and join um, for that event. Um, it looks to be an exciting event um, with various conferences and workshop st style activities um, and it's aimed at the wider system um, to make sure that we're obviously um, so providing information, advice and guidance like, you know, um, equally across the system so that we're all promoting consistent messaging. Um, the links are included on there. And I think the only other thing just to say is thank you again for your time tonight. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to share this information and you'll be able to spread it wider within your practices. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Thank you. Bye. I'll stop recording.